can hold the stars in place. You can hold my heart the same. Whenever I fall away, whenever I start to break. So here I am, lifting up my heart to the one who holds the stars. Darkest nights can't separate, can't keep me from your sight. I get so lost, forget my work. Still, you love and you don't forget my name. If you can hold the stars in place, you can hold my heart the same. Whenever I You can calm the raging sea, you can calm the storm in me, you're never too far away, you never show up too late, so here I am, lifting up my heart, to the one who holds the star. Whenever I fall away, whenever I start to break, so here I am, lifting up my heart. If you can calm the raging sea, you can calm the storm in me. You're never too far away, you never show up too late, so here I am. amazing how God holds the world in his hands, how he created it just with his voice, and we celebrate him here on Sunday. Each, each Sunday, we celebrate what God is doing in our lives. So we ask him this morning, this morning, that the Lord would come down and he would encompass, that he would invite, that we would invite him this morning to inhabit, to encompass and join us as we praise an audience of one. Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some
Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's our hearts, Lord, take it. Dearly Father, Lord, this morning. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives behind the scenes, Lord. We thank you for the blood you shed on the cross, Lord. Every week we come here and and we sing worship songs to you, Lord God. Every Sunday we come here and we, we dive into your word, Lord God. And sometimes we Sometimes we miss the point of why we come here, Lord. I, this morning I'm inviting everyone in here, Lord God, to take a deeper look and to walk in a deeper understanding of you this morning. Lord, this morning as we, as we change the tithes and offerings this morning, Lord, use us. Not only financially, Lord God, but ministry, Lord God, through ministry, Lord building each other up, building the family up, Lord. So, Lord, this morning, not only am I praying for the tithes and the offerings this morning, but I'm asking that we would, that you would, that you would guide our our hearts, Lord God, and guide our minds and remind us, Lord God, that ministry doesn't stop with just giving to the tithes. That's great but it also continues through the work of our hands and our feet. Help us love each other. Thank you, Lord, for the blood. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. the rain.
This is my key principle for this morning. We've been looking at this chapter. This is our second week now in the chapter, uh, chapter 3, and this is my, my main idea. God has always been the one who comes to rescue the afflicted. We're in the book of Exodus um, by extension uh, of the Easter season, and that might seem backwards, right? Why are we in the Old Testament to talk about Easter? Well, what we find, uh, and one of the things we we were, uh, one of the sort of observations we made through the Bible read-through period is that the story of passion, right, the story of our resurrection through Christ's blood is actually, uh, it's a, it's a, Depending on how you look at it, it's a retelling of an old story, that something that happened to the Israelites thousands of years beforehand. Or depending on how you want to look at it, maybe that story is a pretelling, right, of the story of Jesus and the resurrection. And um, so Exodus is, tells the same gospel story, right? The Old Testament has the same gospel as the New Testament, the same message of a God who comes to deliver a people afflicted under slavery of something that they can't get out of on their own. Only by God's mighty hand is there any hope for the people of Israel. Does that sound familiar? Right? Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like the story of Jesus and our story in our relationship to him? I hope that we can begin to see the pieces there. And so, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start a, a, in a series, a six-week series in Exodus chapter uh, 10, 11, and 12, looking at the story of Passover and connecting the details of that story to the story of Jesus. Um, but in so doing, we wanted to do a little introductory series to look at the beginning of the book of Exodus. And what we see is those same themes repeated again and again. And we loved last week, Pastor Bruce Linhart came and, and, and brought the word and, and talked about the burning bush. And the significance of a bush that was on fire but was not burning up. The significance of Moses' story, right? To get to that wilderness place. And um, Pastor Bruce talked a lot about the concept of, of holy ground, right? And so what we're going to talk about, what we're, what we're looking at today is an extension of that moment, that holy ground moment. And really the conversation that ensues after that. But Moses is on a mountaintop. And this is hard for us who are Floridians. If you were born and raised here, a mountaintop is sort of a foreign concept. But um, for, for any of you who grew up up north, I grew up in western Pennsylvania, surrounded by mountains. And, uh, and so you know what a mountaintop's all about. You know that nobody lives on the mountaintop because as uh, my... Uh, one of my wife's uh, family members from West Virginia once said, nobody wants to live on a hill, right? If you ever lived on a hill, you know, what, you know the frustration that that brings in the wintertime when the snow starts and the ice is filling your driveway and it's, it's the difficulty, right, of being on that hill. So the mountaintop is a place of, in the Bible, it's a place of seclusion, right? Because nobody wants to be there because it's hard to live on the mountaintop. But the mountaintop is a place that God draws us to. We see again and again in Scripture people on mountains having moments with God. Jesus repeats this pattern in his own life, right? When he retreats off to wilderness places to have a meeting with God. What happened on Moses' well, Moses had more than one mountaintop, right? But what happened on Moses' first mountaintop moment? With God. Let's read the story as it continues in verse 7. It says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land, that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." 
But Moses said to God, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll read it anyway. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So this, uh, this first section, I, I've, I've attached this, uh, this idea to it, that God is a rescuer. And that's from our key principle already, right? The idea of a rescue that's impending. We talked the first week in this series about suffering a lot and about how that, that question everybody has, right? If, if, the, if there's a good God, if there's an all-powerful, good, benevolent God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there so much pain? And when we read the story of how the Israelites got into Egypt, it's a story of a situation where God was blessing them. You guys remember how we got to Egypt, right? They originally were in Egypt to escape a, a, a famine. So Egypt at first represented not, not a curse, but a blessing. But then they stayed, and, and slowly what happened was there arose a king who knew not Joseph, and the Pharaoh saw the, the blessing of God's people, how, how fast they were growing, how many babies they were, they were having, saw that as a threat. And so he brings them under slavery. And then after the slavery plan doesn't work, he brings them under something even worse. And he makes a command that all of the male children of the Israelites were to be thrown into the Nile. And so this is a, this is a, a human uh, rights crisis, right, of epic proportions, right? This is, this is somebody, this is, uh, this is serious oppression, right, and persecution God's people are under. And the crazy part of the story is that it's clear that God led them there. And so this leaves us with lots of questions, doesn't it, right? And it would, if you were an Israelite, it would leave you with even more questions because it's not just an old story, it's what you're experiencing. So the whole of chapter two, chapters 1 and 2 plays out, and God doesn't really say anything until the very end. Do you guys remember that? God's, God's opinion on what was happening to his people doesn't get told to us at the end of the chapter, but what we do have is the story of a baby, right? This baby Moses who was rescued up out of the Nile through this ark that his mom made and, pit, and covered with tar, and it was found by, the, the, it's found by a, a crowd of people, and he ends up being raised in Pharaoh's house, but then he ends up in the wilderness. And, and so this story of what seems like random and chaotic events, at the very end, Jesus, uh, God shows up and says a couple of things. And they're repeated in this section that we just read. Some of you might have caught it. They're repeated in this section that we just read. It says in verse 7, that says that the Lord says, I have surely, can you say it with me? Seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. The Bible from the very beginning doesn't stray away from the question and the problem of suffering, right? That thing that everybody wants an answer to. If God's good, why is there suffering? And one of the first pieces of good news that we have is that God is not, we don't have a God who is unaware of the suffering that we go through. That he sees it. That he's looking. That he hasn't turned his back from his people. How many of you have had a moment where you weren't sure maybe God has turned his back away from me? Right? But in this moment, God shows up to Moses and says, I want to dispel a myth. I want to, I want to, I want to correct something you might believe that the enemy might have convinced you of. It's not that I'm unaware. I see the affliction of my people. I can see that they're struggling. I can see the dark circles under their eyes because the taskmasters are so brutal and so cruel, right? I can see the hopelessness. And, and, and it's not just a temporary thing that they're under, right? This is 400 years of slavery, so this is generations of hopelessness 
And God says, I can see all of that. It doesn't stop there, right? What's the next thing it says that God, that God says? It says? It says, I've seen the affliction of my people who are, who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. Two weeks ago, we talked about how God always responds when his people cry out. Like a, like a mother with their child, they can't help but respond to the cries of that baby. God can't help but respond to the cries of his people. He can't not hear it. He always hears it. See, the problem is that from their perspective, it felt like they had been crying for a really long time and God had been doing nothing. But what the story in chapter 2 tells us is that God had already been moving for decades. Before this moment with Moses on the mountaintop, he had been moving for decades to put Moses in this spot. What's the next thing? He says, I, I know their sufferings. Suffering is a heavy word, right? It's, it's not just pain. It's, it's pain that has been going on for a long period of time. It implies the elapsing of time. Suffering. Somebody says, I know your pain. Right? That's a comforting statement because pain has this way of isolating us. Right? If we're walking through, we lose a loved one. Right? There's, there's this sense that like nobody understands what I'm going through. Even, and, it's, and in a way, we're, when we say that, we're, we're kind of right, right. Nobody has gone through your exact life situation. Nobody's lost that loved one before. But how interesting that in this moment, God says to Moses, I know your sufferings. It's not just that I see it. It's not just that I've heard the, the evidence of it in your cry. He says, I know what you're going through. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how God isn't just somebody who can empathize with, with our weakness, with our pain. He can sympathize, right? He's been there in Christ, right? In Jesus, he experienced all of that. Isaiah beautifully tells that story in a, in a prophecy about Christ. It says, Surely He has borne our griefs, and He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. See that word again? Afflicted. Right? He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds... We are healed. We have in the scriptures this amazing promise, this amazing truth that we don't serve a God who looks down on our suffering and says, isn't that too bad? He looks down on our sufferings and says, I know your suffering. And then the last thing he says is that, um, says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And with that Jesus connection that we just made, right, we can see there's, a, a, there's this theme in Scripture of God's willingness to show up in the time of his people's need and to rescue. And, and what he doesn't say is, God, uh, uh, Mo, I have chosen you to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. He says, I have come down and I'm the one that's going to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians. Pastor Bruce last week talked about the whole angel of the Lord thing, right? And that this is a moment, one of these moments in the Old Testament, where it seems there's this pre-incarnate appearance of God right there with Moses. And he says, here I am. I'm here to rescue my people. God is first in Scripture revealed to us as a creator, right? And he's second revealed to us in Scripture as a savior or a rescuer. In some ways, it's a recreator, right? To put back 
what was broken since the fall. And so God himself comes up, comes in, shows up in the story of his people to save them from something that they could never save themselves from. So that's the first thing we see, is that God is a rescuer. The second thing we see is that God is an ever-present collaborator. It's a little bit longer, uh, but at, and this comes from a shorter section. It starts in verse 11. It says that Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Egypt, Israel out of Egypt? <clears throat> he said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now this is the first question that Moses asks in a long series of questions that continues all the way into the next chapter. And we're going to spend next week talking about that. But, His questions start with logical, and then they start to get more and more belligerent as the story goes on. If you're familiar with the story, we can start to read in all all the stuff from chapter 4 where Moses basically tells God, I can't do this. Which, by the way, how many of you would be there with Mo? (laughs) Moses is an incredibly relatable character in the story. And, and it starts with this question, who am I? And it's a, and it's a legitimate question. Why? And I, I don't even think it, we have to start with the why me. You know, Moses, the ex-con, or Moses, the guy on the run, right? The guy who is uh, on the FBI most wanted list, right? For killing a, an Egyptian taskmaster. Um, they're, at least their equivalent of the FBI most wanted list. He says, this is not exactly the guy that you want representing you before the you know, Egyptian government. A guy who they want to put in jail. <laughs> but before we even go to that, I think there's something deeper in the question that Moses is asking, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt, is, is why do you even need me, God? Right? Why does God even need any of us? See, he's the one, we, we, if we believe chapters 1 and 2 of the Bible, right? he's the one that, that created everything out of nothing with, the, with, the, with just, his, just his word. He's, uh, in an instant, he created galaxies. So do we really think he needs our help to defeat a king in Egypt? Right? Like Pharaoh... Pharaoh's might and God's might. Are they even in the same category? No. But yet God shows up to Moses and says, I'm sending you. (laughs) And so Moses is just the first guy to ask the question that I think we all ask. God, who am I? (laughs) Why do you need me? Don't you have the capacity to do this without me? And of course, the answer to that question is affirmative. (laughs) Yes, he doesn't need you, but he wants us, right? And ever since the beginning, God has been this collaborator, this person who wants to work alongside his image bearers, man and woman. That was the whole point in the garden, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you over this place. I'm putting you in charge. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. That's always been God's plan A. God have, could have filled the earth and subdued it. He could have done all of that by himself. He chose to create us and to give us that assignment. And what's interesting is he doesn't just, he's not like an absentee manager boss who likes to give assignments and then disappear. Don't you love it when that happens? He's not, uh, he's not a, um, he's not a, I had bolded this point. He's not a delegator, he's a collaborator. Because that's the next thing, that is, is Moses's, uh, or God's response to Moses' question. He, he doesn't really explain the whole collaborator thing. We know that from Genesis. And from his nature in every other in every other moment in human history where he chooses to use us. 
But what God does say is, I'm going to be with you. I'm not just delegating, hey, take care of this for me. I've got other more important things to do. I've got other galaxies I'm spinning. So if you could go and save my people, that would be great, Mo. He says, um, I'm going to collaborate with you. I want you to go and be my mouthpiece, but I'm going to be with you. You see that? I will be with you, and this will be the sign for you. Where have we seen this before? We've seen this later in the New Testament, Matthew 28, right, where Jesus sends his, the, the, the 12, or so, well, at that point, the 11, out after his ascension. He says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So it's very, if we, if we look at it, it's actually a very similar assignment. Hey, go into this place that you're, where you're not going to be welcome, but you're going you're gonna to rescue people. <laughs> and I'm going to give you signs and wonders to do that. And, uh, oh, and by the way, what, how does it end? Some of you remember? And I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So God's people doing God's work God's way. Will never lack his provision, that's the old preacher saying. But it will also never lack God's presence. That if we, are, if we take God's assignment, if we take his invitation, right, to collaborate with him in his work of restoring people to himself. He promises his provision, but he also promises his presence. And Mo was going to need that, right? Walking for the eighth time and the ninth time into that palace to say the same thing, to get the same result, right? He was going to need that Reminder, I'm with you. Verse 13 continues the next point that God is dependable. This is a, this is a big section. 13 starts, Then Moses said to God, if, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the, Lord, the, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am... I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is a famous section. It's also kind of a weird section, right? At least it's, it's weird in the way it's translated in English. It's, it's, I am doesn't sound like a name, does it? <laughs> if I introduced myself, well, first of all, it would be totally blasphemous. But like if somebody introduced themselves as I am to you, you'd be like, that's not a name that's a sentence, right? <laughs> or a phrase, at least. And so what's going on here? Well, Moses makes a good point. Moses was raised in polytheistic Egypt, right? Surrounded by the myriad of gods that the Egyptians worshipped. So everybody had a god. It's kind of like now, except we do it more secretly, Right? We don't worship statues. We worship bank accounts and car payments and all that stuff, right? So we're not that different from them. But let's, we all know, like, the, the Egypt, just like the Greeks, like, they had this, this, this panoply of gods that they worshipped. And so Moses makes a great point. He says, when I go to tell them that this God has come to save them, I, I see the burning bush, I hear your voice, I, I have no choice but to believe you in this moment. But they're not here right now. So when I go and represent you with this message, who am I saying has sent me? <laughs> and God makes the introduction. See, there's a couple of words that are used in this chapter and in the, in the, in the Bible in general, in the, especially in the Hebrew Bible, that we all translate different forms and different ways in English. So I want to help you out a little bit here, right? So there's a couple of words. The first one is the word Elohim or Elohim. You guys have heard of that one before? 
And Elohim is the Hebrew word that we usually translate just the word G-O-D, God. But the problem is Elohim is not very specific. Elohim is like me introduce you. We have an introduction, and I call myself human. Right? That would be accurate. It's just not helpful. You already knew I was human by looking at me. <laughs> and so, so when, when, we refer, when the Bible says just God, it's the word Elohim. And, and when it's capital G, we know it's referring to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's, underneath it is that word Elohim, which could refer to any deity. Okay? The second word we see uh, the most often, at least in this chapter, is the word or it's actually, we translate it as a phrase, the Lord. And so the Lord is, when we see that show up in the Old Testament, especially when it's capital L-O-R-D, we know it's the word Yahweh, which is God's name. That's the, his proper name, right? My name's Ben, his name is Yahweh. And so what Yahweh means is, and there's a lot of different ways that you can translate it, and because and, English and Hebrew are very uh, different languages in the way they, they operate, but it's something along the lines of the, he who always was, or he who always will be. It's the ever, it's the eternal one. And so what God is saying in, in the original Hebrew here is um, he's actually using the, his, his, his name in a different form of speech. He's, instead of saying he, the, he who always was, he says, I'm the one who always was. Instead of Yahweh, he says, Aweh. So the Hebrew phrase, I am who I am, is Aweh aser Aweh. I am the one who always was. I'm loosely translating here, obviously, but he, he puts his name in the first person. Now, what is the significance of that name? What do we know from the Bible? Names are always important. The meanings of names are important. My name's Ben, and most people uh, don't know the meaning of my name, right? When they refer to me as Ben, it's just like, a, it's, a, it's this... It's a name. It doesn't have a meaning behind it. It does have a meaning, and I'm trying to remember what it is. Um, Benjamin is, I believe, son of my right hand in Hebrew. So you couldn't, but in Hebrew, every time you heard that, you would think son of my right hand. The meaning is always connected to the saying of the name. And so, but that's not how we use names, but that's how they use names back then. So every time you hear Yahweh, you think the one who always was. Every time you hear Moses, you're supposed to think the one drawn up out of the water. And so Moses is named by the salvation moment that that little baby crying was heard and was rescued from impending death and otherwise would have drowned with thousands of other babies just like him. He was marked by that moment by his name. God is marked in the Hebrew text by his name as what? Not just any God. Not just Elohim. There's lots of Elohim out there, at least in their worldview, right? But he's, he's a specific Elohim. He's the Elohim who always was, who always is, who always will be. And so actually when you see the phrase the Lord God, what it's saying is Yahweh Elohim, or Elohim Yahweh. It's the God who always is, always was, always will be in, in, behind God revealing his name, he's communicating something about himself. So that when the Israelites are, got their backs against the Red Sea, right, and the Egyptians are coming with their chariots, what are they supposed to remember when they cry out to the name of their God? <laughs> he's always been there in the past. He was there for us back then. He'll be for us now. He'll be for us in the future. He's dependable. He's, he's reliable. He's pre-existent. And he's different than any other little G-O-D God. That was what he was communicating in this phrase. 
That's all well and good that he always was, always is, always will be. But there's one more thing about his nature that's, that's critical for the good news to be good news. Because just being is great, but what is he doing? Well, he's a rescuer, but he's not just any rescuer. He's a rescuer with a mighty hand, and that's what he communicates in the last verses. Look at verse 16. It says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of, Egypt, elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, Yahweh, the Elohim, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to Yahweh, our Elohim. I will know, but I know, he says, this is God speaking still, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless he is compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Every detail of what, what, uh, what he just talked about was already revealed to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15. They, they would go to Egypt, that he would bring them up out of Egypt, they would leave Egypt with cash and prizes. And so, but the thing I want to clue in on right before we, as we close, is that phrase that's right in the middle there. And what he knows, God knows that the king of Egypt will not let them go, it says, unless, um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, unless that they, unless he is compelled, it says, by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand, and by implication, his mighty hand. Right. This phrase, a mighty hand, shows up sixteen times in the Old Testament to refer to God, and, and actually, usually, it's referring back to the salvation of God's people in Egypt, it's saying. Remember when I did that thing? Remember all those plagues and the, and, the, and the Passover? Remember the Red Sea? All of that story? Who did that? You think Moses did that? Now Moses didn't have any of that if it wasn't for me. Deuteronomy 4, uh, 34 says, Has any God ever attempted to go and take a nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. God's mighty hands are a comfort, right, to God's people. Because God's mighty hand is used to rescue them and it's used to afflict and to defend them against their enemies. It's, it's, it's like in Psalm 23 where it says, your rod and staff... Those weapons, right, are a comfort. Weapons don't usually comfort people unless they're being used in their defense. And so we have a God who has a mighty hand. Israel could never gloat about their salvation and position as God's people because God did all the work by his mighty hand. And I think it's interesting. I don't know if there's any significance to it, but notice it's not his mighty hands. He didn't need both of them. He only needed one. Right? He, he just shows up, and, 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 and that in and of itself is the rescue plan. 
Peter says uh, in five, chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him, because he cares for you. His care, his presence, his always being and always will being is great, is a great, is great news but if it wasn't for his mighty hand, if he wasn't stronger, more powerful, more sovereign than anyone, any other thing, any other person, any other deity, any other power, then it wouldn't be good news. But we have a God who has a mighty hand. I'm going to ask that you bow your heads. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I ask what, what Peter asked. Are, are we humbled under the saving and mighty hand of God? Or are we proudly standing like self-made men of faith? Do we know that the same God who rescued Moses and Israel has saved us by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ? And do you believe that last line from Peter's letter, that he cares for you? Lord Jesus, we struggle. We struggle in the midst of our sin. We struggle in the midst of our lives to remember these truths. Would you help us to know that from the beginning you've been a God who rescues. You've been a God who's been restoring brokenness. You've been a God showing your love to your people. So, Lord, would you restore us to yourselves in all the ways that we need restoring? Would you heal us? Would you, would you hear us as we cry out? And I don't know what we need to say. But for those of us who need a rescue this morning, would we cry out? And we know that we have a promise that you'll hear us when we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up one more time and let's worship the Lord this morning. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven to do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn. you can do you're faithful and true though the storms may come and the winds may blow remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word will come to pass great is your faith Great faithfulness. 
you're a forever faithful, Lord. Lord, our faith and our hope is found in you, Lord. Let our, not, let our faith not grow dim, Lord God. Let our faith not grow stale this week, Lord. Let our hope not fade, Lord God, with time. But help us be forever vigilant. And you, we need our, re- our rescue comes from you and from you alone. This week, help us with stamina, Lord God. We have our, we find our rest in you, Lord God. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, bring us back next week, Lord God. Help us go out this week and share the news, the good news of the year forever faithful, even in Moses' time, Lord God. Today, you are still the same. Bring us back safely in Jesus' precious name.